Every year, flea and tick problems with pets rank among the highest issues in veterinary hospitals. Both fleas and ticks are considered parasites that feed on the blood of their host and transmit a number of serious diseases. A parasite is any organism that lives on or in an organism of another species, from the body of which it obtains nutriment without contributing to the well-being of that organism. Parasites can be grouped in two categories, internal parasites and external parasites. Internal parasites generally live within the host animal. One of the most commonly thought of internal parasites would be intestinal worms. External parasites live and feed outside of the host, or in this case, the pet. It's the job of the animal care professional to understand these most common parasites, learn how they are diagnosed, and help to rid the host animal of them whenever possible. As an animal care professional, it is also your job to educate your clients on the risks of these parasites and what they can do at home to prevent their infestation. In this video overview, we will discuss two of the most common external parasites presented in veterinary hospitals, fleas and ticks. Let's begin by discussing some of the many issues associated with fleas. Fleas are small, dark-colored, agile insects with tube-like mouthparts adapted to feeding on the blood of their hosts. This, combined with their very quick reproductive cycle, make them a difficult challenge to eliminate from the pet and the environment. In order to thoroughly understand how to treat and prevent their infestations from occurring, it's important to first understand the life cycle of the flea. The flea life cycle begins with the adult female flea acquiring a blood meal from the pet and laying her eggs, usually on the skin or hair of the pet. Adult fleas must feed on blood before they become capable of reproduction. The flea can consume as much as 15 times its weight in blood each day. Female fleas are capable of laying up to 40 to 50 eggs per day. These eggs will then fall off the pet onto the carpet, sofa, yard, or other locations the pet visits frequently. These eggs are very small white spheres that will hatch into larvae in 2 to 14 days depending on the conditions. Flea larva emerges from the eggs to feed on any available organic material, including feces of other fleas, known as flea dirt. Flea larva tends to avoid light and keep to dark places such as cracks, crevices, and bedding. If adequate supply of food is available, larvae will complete their development in 5 to 10 days and spin a silk-like cocoon in which they molt to the pupa stage. The final transformation to the adult flea occurs within the cocoon and the newly formed adult flea emerges when properly stimulated by heat, carbon dioxide, and other environmental stimuli, which might indicate an available food source is in the area. The entire cycle, from egg to adult, can take as little as two weeks or as long as six months, depending on environmental conditions. The adult flea is probably the only stage of the flea's life cycle you're likely to observe. The other stages are generally very difficult to see without magnification. Even spotting the adult flea requires a close and thorough examination of the skin. There are certain locations on the pet where fleas more commonly congregate. Focusing your search in these locations increases your chances that fleas will be found. The key locations on most dogs and cats would be the tail area, head and neck, and finally the belly. These areas should always be evaluated when assessing the pet for the presence of fleas. The feces of adult fleas, or flea dirt as it is referred to, is often a first clue that fleas are present on the pet. These reddish-brown feces often possess a characteristic curled appearance, or may occur as dirt-like specks. Passing a flea comb or fine-toothed comb through the hair coat will often trap fleas and flea dirt. This is probably the simplest method to evaluate for fleas. The reason the cycle is important for you to know is that developing an effective flea control program involves more than just killing the adult fleas. It also involves interrupting their reproductive cycle at various levels to alleviate future generations of fleas. We will discuss key steps in effective flea control in a subsequent section of this program. 
Why do fleas cause such a problem for dogs and cats? Like many other parasitic insects, fleas tend to leave behind small quantities of saliva during the feeding process. The saliva is often very irritating to the host animal and creates both a local and systemic allergic reaction. This allergic reaction can leave a sensitive dog or cat feeling miserably itchy. This itch, if not controlled, may cause the dog or cat to chew or scratch at large portions of their hair coat. When a pet shows these reactions to flea bites, they are categorized with a flea allergy. Fleas pose a second hazard in that they can substantially deplete the blood supply on a small pet, leading to a life-threatening anemia. This is especially true of very young kittens and puppies. Another hazard is that fleas commonly spread a parasite called the tapeworm. Within the tiny body of some fleas exists the developing stages of the double pore tapeworm. When a dog or cat bites at areas on their body with flea infestations, they occasionally end up ingesting several fleas. Once inside the pet's digestive system, the tapeworm develops into a long segmented worm. Segments of this worm are then often passed out of the rectum and may be recognized around the anus or on the stool. They may appear resembling grains of rice or sesame seeds. They too can be cleared from the pet with proper treatment. Owners whose pets have tapeworms may not be aware that their pet has or has had fleas in the recent past. One of the reasons for this is that those pets that are meticulous in their grooming are not as likely to have fleas noticeable on their coat. However, they are more likely to have ingested fleas during the grooming process. Like fleas, ticks are blood-sucking parasites. They attach themselves to their host and remain attached for an extended period of time, often several days. During this time, the tick will become engorged with blood. This extended feeding period makes the tick an ideal carrier for various bloodborne diseases. Common diseases transmitted by ticks include Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Lyme Disease, and Ehrlichiosis. Only a small percentage of ticks carry these disease-causing organisms. These diseases, when present, occur more commonly in certain areas of the country. It is important for you to identify the specific tick-transmitted diseases that are common in your area. It is also important to recognize that some of the diseases ticks carry can also be spread to humans. A tick-infested environment not only puts pets at risk, but also their owners. Removing a tick from an animal should be done with care not to squeeze the body of the tick while pulling it off. Careful handling reduces the chances of infusing infectious debris and organisms into the animal from the tick. Grasping near the head of the tick where it has attached itself to the animal and creating gentle pressure will often be sufficient to initiate its release. Gently pulling the tick straight out away from the skin is usually adequate. Once the tick has released, Clean the area thoroughly with alcohol or hydrogen peroxide to help reduce the chances of infection. Dispose the tick in a small jar of alcohol and save it if possible. This will help for identification of the tick to determine if infection has occurred. You may sometimes notice two ticks attached to the skin and hair. These are mating ticks. The female ticks will become quite engorged with eggs and will often obscure the presence of the male ticks. As many as 8,000 eggs are contained in some engorged ticks. The female tick will detach herself from the dog or cat and return to her environment to lay her eggs. Most ticks infecting dogs and cats will need three hosts to complete their development. Upon hatching, the young seed ticks will search out a source such as a rodent for their first meal. The seed ticks will feed on this first host for a few days and then drop off to molt to the nymph in the environment. After several weeks or months, the nymph will often climb to the tops of the grass or weeds and wait for a passing animal. Once they have clinched on a passing animal, they quickly set out to get a blood meal. The nymph will feed for a few days or a week and then drop off to molt to the adult stage. The adult stage will then seek out a host on which to feed. Because of the large number of eggs they lay in their environment, 
it becomes extremely important to control ticks, not only on the pet, but also in the environment. In subsequent sections of this program, we will discuss simple steps in helping to treat and prevent ticks on both the pet and in the environment.